Coming up on this week's show, we find out about the fifth gender from Gail Carriger. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 189 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Will Knaus. Hello! <laughs> this episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. We'll have more information on how you can join them at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we have coming up next week. This week's interview transcript is sponsored by Dream Spinner Press. Dream Spinner Press is proud to publish Hank Edwards and Deanna Wadsworth and their latest book, Murder Most Lovely. Check it out and all the new mystery and suspense titles from authors like Amy Lane, Casey Wells, Tara Lane, and Reese Ford, just to name a few, and to find your new favorite author while you're at it. Just go to dreamspinnerpress.com for everything you'll ever want in gay romance. Welcome back, everyone. We hope you had a fantastic week filled with lots of good reading. Um, I know for a lot of you, the uh, school season is wrapping up. Uh, prom season is upon us. Uh, and, <laughs> and graduation season. Gradua- oh, God. Graduation <laughs> season. Uh, and then uh, summer break for a lot of you is coming up. So uh, you're probably planning fun and frivolity. And hopefully, amongst all that fun and frivolity, you'll have a chance to read some really great books. Speaking of really great books, you, sir, have been uh, hard, very hard at work. I can attest. He has, he's been working his little fingers to the bone this past week. Do you want to tell everyone what you've been doing? Yeah, it's been a, a mix of uh, dealing with getting the final edits into Hat Trick so it's all nice and tidy for the good editors over at Harmony Inc., uh, but also getting ready for the release of Netminder, which is the fourth and final book in the Codename Winger series. It comes out in just another week mm-hmm. on Tuesday, May 28th. And uh, this one, Theo, as we've talked about it in the last episode, is on the run. Uh, bad things have happened, and he's been forced to engage the emergency protocols he's got in place with his parents. That uh, if something's going really wrong, you know, he needs to to get away, find some shelter, try to deal with the problem. And over the course of the books, you know, he's he's been trained more as an agent as he goes. But, you know, at the end of the day, he's still 17 years old. And every now and then that teenager or even the kid kind of pops out uh, when he's trying to be all, you know, firm and agent-like to get ready for the release. I've actually put this week on my blog at jeffadamswrites.com a deleted scene. Uh, I've, I've never had deleted scenes before to the level that I had them in this book. And the problem that I ran into with a couple beta readers and uh, my wonderful Laura at Harmony Inc., who has helped guide this series so well, is that apparently I was writing an episode of 24 where nobody got a break ever. (laughs) (laughs) It was just go, 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 go. And uh, these readers quite rightly said that, you know, Theo's a kid, he needs a break occasionally. And the reader also needs a break from a relentless pace. So I restructured the first third of the book to kind of ease things up a little bit, I guess. And uh, what I've got on the blog this week is a scene uh, that doesn't give any spoilers to the rest of the book. It was really the only one I could do a deleted scene from and not spoil something else. Um, So you could check that out and and see what things could have been like if I was writing an episode of 24. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll be up um, when this episode drops on jeffhandomswrites.com. And there'll be a link in the show notes as well if you want to go directly to it. Fantastic. Yeah. So I want to call out a new podcast that has cropped up over the last month. It's called the Creative Queer Podcast, and it's hosted by Jonah Kilde and Renessa Kiampa. Uh, they are both designers uh, working in New York City, and they created this show to really have a discussion about all things queer and creative. And I've really enjoyed in their first set of episodes kind of the wide uh array of creatives that they've brought onto the show. Uh, They've had comic Chlo Chuna, 
They've had cabaret performer, TV writer, and YA novelist. How's that for a triple threat mm. right there uh, with Justin Sayer? And most recently, this this past week, they had GLAD's director of digital and social media, Brendan Davis, on. And for those who don't know, by the way, GLAD is the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. Uh, each of these creatives has come on with some really interesting stories, how they got into what they're doing, what their projects are, how they hope to impact the world with these with these individual projects. It's been really great to hear them. And I'm looking forward to this week's show. On May 22nd, uh, they're going to be talking to Brendan Scholl, who's a trans man who is featured in the documentary Draw With Me. So if you want to check them out, you can find them at the creativequeerpodcast.com. And of course, we will have that in the show notes. And they're on all the podcatchers out there, too. So very nice to have them on the podcast scene, and we wish them all the best. Indeed. Now, recently, we have been partaking of some Netflix shows. Uh, not too long ago, the new season of she premiered. Uh, the first seven episodes of this season, and we binged them in quick order. Um, essentially, this second season, uh, this seven episodes, is a half season. They essentially split up season two, more or less, even though they're calling it a full season. It's seven episodes. They're really delightful and interesting. Um, this, this time we find Adora sort of struggling with the pressures of what being she is all about. While uh, <laughs> her arch nemesis, Katra, is essentially dealing with the same thing. Mm -hmm. She's trying to live up to the expectations of being a force captain. Uh, there are a lot of really terrific episodes and a lot of storylines going on. Uh, there's a particularly interesting episode that kind of gives us the backstory of Shadow Weaver. Also, uh, in episode seven, we finally meet Bo's two dads. Yeah. Um, they go and visit them at the, essentially the his dads are uh, historical librarians, and they need to find some some stuff out. So they go and visit uh, his dads, who uh, Bo has been keeping in the dark. Uh, they've assumed he's been away at school, but um, he has to come hmm. out and tell them that he wants to be a member of the resistance. Uh, it's really it's a very charming. It's a very funny episode, uh, and we I really enjoyed this first half of this season. It ends on a cliffhanger. Uh, but don't worry, uh, it's just going to be, I think it's roughly two months. Yeah, they're back in August, yeah. I heard. Yeah, the new episodes are coming up really soon. So we highly recommend you check that out. And something else you can look at, because we haven't mentioned this in a, in a few weeks now, but it's going to start being mentioned a lot more soon. Uh, Pose, our favorite show from last summer, is getting ready to make its return to FX on Tuesday, June 11th. And just recently, season one of Pose has dropped on Netflix. So if you missed it last year, and why would you? Because we only talked about it maybe every other week that it was on. Uh, you could catch it on Netflix. Or if you're like us, you can maybe go back and catch season one again before season two begins next month. High school hockey player? Computer whiz? Covert agent? Theo Reese's life is split between being a normal teenager and a secret agent who goes by the code name Winger. After years of providing mission support from behind his keyboard, he's thrust into an unexpected world of adventure and danger. In Tracker Hacker, the first book in the Codename Winger series by Jeff Adams, it becomes personal for Theo, as an enemy organization compromises tactical operational support's agent tracker system. Among the missing agents, his father. Theo puts his life on the line to stop the hack and rescue his dad. Diverse Reader says, Wow, talk about a wild ride from beginning to end. I could not stop reading. Discover the world of Codename Winger with Tracker Hacker. Available in ebook, paperback, and audiobook, as narrated by John Solo. So I read a tremendous YA novel this past week. It's called Queer as a $5 Bill by debut novelist Lee Wind. Now this book features 15-year-old Wyatt, who lives in Lincolnville, Oregon, where the town is obsessed with all things Abraham Lincoln. There's a parade on his birthday, there are Civil War reenactments, Wyatt's parents run a Lincoln slept here B&B. &B. It's all very Lincoln all the time. Um, 
when Wyatt gets a book report to do on Lincoln, he ends up assigned a book that implies that Lincoln was in love with his best friend, Joshua Fry Speed. And we've all heard this periodically in Lincoln history. Now, when Wyatt delivers this information to the class, he discovers exactly how homophobic his town is. And he also finds out how far people will go to defend their version of history, no matter the cost. And all this makes it even more difficult for him to come out until he finds some amazing allies who say it's okay if he's gay and if Lincoln was gay too. Now, my love of this book starts very much with these teenage characters. Wyatt really wants to do right by everybody, even if it means keeping himself in the closet. He wants his parents B and B to be successful, which so far it really is not. He doesn't want to make waves in the town or at school. But he eventually finds his breaking point, too, when it comes down to fighting for what he believes in. As he's researching this history, Wyatt discovers Martin's YouTube channel. And Martin is another teenager who also talks about history and some of the interesting nuggets in it. Um, he eventually meets out and proud Martin because it's Martin's mom who swoops in to help Wyatt's parents with some of the legal pressure that the town is applying to get Wyatt to stop talking about Lincoln and Speed because it's really screwing up the town's economy with all the Lincoln stuff coming up because they're getting ready for the big birthday parade. Now, Martin helps Wyatt to realize the importance of what he's doing and that it's really okay to live as yourself. And even the jerk high school kids that are in this book are written with so much authenticity and dimension that you really fall into their stories too. And it's really a credit to Lee how he kind of pulls all this together uh, to make such inherently readable and relatable characters. I love how much actual history is mixed into this book. It's really brilliant as we, we've all heard about Lincoln being gay and we've heard those rumors and how it all ties back to Joshua Speed. But this book and through Wyatt's eyes, it really lays out some of the facts as they're presented. There's an interview with Lee at the end of the audiobook where he talks about the research that he did to get this book as accurate as it is. And it's really a credit to him how he's made a history lesson without making it feel like you're reading a textbook because it's really Wyatt trying to piece all this stuff together. And there are some really great comparisons to Lincoln and Martin Luther King in the book too. Uh, it's a history lesson without a history lesson, kind of like going to Hamilton. You get the big infusion of history while you enjoyed a great musical. Uh, while there is a lot of history in the book, this overall story is very much rooted in our time. Wyatt's story goes viral with Martin's help because Martin really knows how to work the internet. And soon Wyatt is way in over his head. As things escalate, which include Wyatt ending up on a Fox News-esque show, the school in town doing everything they can to silence him, and, and lots of other insanity, there were times I was like, this is really over the top. And then in the next one, I'm like, it really isn't because in the in these crazy times where we can look at the news and really ask ourselves what the hell was that everything that goes on in the book you could easily see just escalating in the society that we've got today and lee perfectly captured all that and it grounds the book actually with a very here and now kind of feel to it i have to give a quick shout out to to michael crouch uh, michael's the voice of becky albertalli simon versus the homo sapiens agenda and he does a tremendous job with the large cast of adults and kids that are in this book. And it was really nice to find another book that carried his voice, because I don't think I've encountered him since Simon uh, a couple of years back. So I highly recommend for a great YA read, Queer as a $5 Bill by Lee Wind. Now, remember, guys, if you want more details on the books or anything else we mentioned in this episode, all you have to do is go to the show notes page at BigGayFictionPodcast.com for episode 189. Want to hang out with us between shows? Check us out on Facebook. You never know what we might post. News about book sales, bonus video content, and maybe even a live broadcast or two. Like us today at Facebook.com slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast and see what we get up to next. And just a reminder about Facebook, we are live each Sunday morning starting about 1030 Eastern Time. That's 730 Pacific. You could tune in and watch us do our recording, see what kind of bloopers we decide to make in any given week. And you'll also get the chance to ask us any questions that you may have as well. So we hope you join us on Facebook.com slash Big Gay Fiction Podcast for a live recording soon. 
Now, I had the chance recently to talk to Gail Carriger. Uh, she also writes under G.L. Carriger. Those books are some of the more sexy books and is what her new fifth gender book is written under. It was really fun to talk to her about this book, and I think you all are going to enjoy this interview as well. Welcome, Gail, to the podcast. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. I'm so glad we finally got you on the show because I've been, you know, I've been reading since back with Sumage Solution and it's like, we got to get Gail on. We need to get Gail on. I am delighted. I, I am a, I am a devoted listener and uh, so I'm quite honored to finally, finally get to be here. It's great. <laughs> and you've got a book coming out. Well, you've just had a book come out actually. Uh, the I Fifth Gender did. just released. I, yes, The Fifth Gender. It's my like crazy, ridiculous silly, happy, yet cozy murder mystery on a space station with an alien with five genders and uh, tentacles and purple. <laughs> so, you don't yeah. often get cozy mystery space station I, together oh in one God. package. <laughs> it is. It's great. It was totally one of those spontaneous um I had a, like a strange thought slash dream slash idea to do this. And a bunch of us were joking on Twitter about the craziest mashups of genres we could come up with. And somebody was like, barbarian noir and so on and so forth. And, uh, and I was like, well, I want to do space station cozy mysteries. And then I started thinking about it and then it happened. <laughs> and yeah. then I was like, oh, okay, I'll write it. I'll write it. I was supposed to be writing something else, of course. But sometimes, sometimes I succumb to the lure of the ooh shiny. <laughs> and it was a purple shiny too. So how could you resist that? <laughs> I could not. I could not. And he's adorable, uh, the alien character. And I, you know, I come, I have a background as an anthropologist. I have an archaeology, a couple of archaeology degrees. And so I just love the way if you're doing an alien character you can you can comment on like human social structures and culture and interactions and so i might have had a little too much fun with that <laughs> well i was i was actually going to get into that I, I, i'll hold that I'm jumping ahead. Oh, dear. because we should we should at least tell folks because i want to talk a little bit more about the origin story on this because you you wrote about it so just like <laughs> I had this idea in the middle of the night, and then I tweeted it, and then it was a story, <laughs> which I love. But then there's the fact that you went away to a retreat and worked on it and had to talk to other people about That's it while you were correct. writing it. <laughs> yes. Yes. So um, for for those – I should preface this by saying that for those who don't know, I, I have two names I write under. So I write under Gail Carriger and I write under G.L. Carriger. And the G.L. stuff has a much higher heat level, so it's super sexy. And this book, The Fifth Gender, is a GL book. So warning for anybody who who, who doesn't 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 like Nookie, because one of the things I realized through the course of uh, of that particular writing retreat was that if you're writing about a species with five genders, human curiosity wants to follow them into the bedroom <laughs> to see what it's like down there. Uh, and so I thought about trying to kind of clean it up a little bit. And it just didn't, it didn't work. <laughs> so I was like, okay, <laughs> we are going into, into that realm. Um, so, and one of those was, so I was, I was supposed to go on this retreat and write something else entirely. And instead I just spent the entire week writing this book. And one of the, the funniest stories from that was me being like, oh shoot, uh, what does alien jizz taste like? <laughs> because, because we all know, at least we do if, if we've been reading my San Andreas uh, shifter series, that, that wizard or, or mage jizz is fizzy and, uh, and werewolf is spicy. And I was like, well, what do aliens taste like? And this meant that I literally had to go and you're not, you're never on a, on a retreat. You're never supposed to disturb the cooks in the kitchen. But I was like, if there was ever a question for cooks, this is it. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> there's a cr crazy author running into the kitchen in the middle of them making shepherd's pie and being like, Oh, you guys, <laughs> what does alien jizz taste like debate? <laughs> you know? So, we had a long debate about it, and we finally decided. And uh, you'll have to read the book to find out. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to ask you to spoil that, but I do have to know, what exactly did the cooks make of this question? <laughs> the cooks were quite game, actually. I think they were pretty charmed, because normally, like, they're doing their art form, and we're doing our art form, and never the twain shall meet until mealtimes. Um, so it's really rare for one of the authors to actually want the cooks' help on something. So I think they were kind of pleased to be asked <laughs> that's that's very cool because some of them might have been like i'm sorry what 
Oh, they know what I write. <laughs> We've been going for a long time for the same cooks for a while. So <laughs> So this group knew you, so they weren't necessarily surprised by No. Well it was it was a little out of the blue. I, I, I haven't been writing the super sexy stuff for very long. Like normally my questions are like what's the most ridiculously named, you know, Victorian dessert you can think of kind of thing. But <laughs> But yes, it was a little different from my usual questions. But. <laughs> and tell us what this book is about, this cozy mystery on a space station. Well, um, the the tagline is uh, an alien race with no word for murder has a mur murderer aboard their spaceship. And essentially the Galloway are the aliens in question. And they're these purple, there's these adorable sort of purple tentacled kind of, you know, high elf, slightly looking alien creatures. And um, they are super isolationist. And the only thing that humans know about them is occasionally they will kick one of their genders. It's always, it's always um, one of the examples of the fourth or fifth genders and they're kicked off and they're ex in exile. And those Galloy, which is the name of this alien race, go and live amongst humans. And humans actually adore them because they think they're like sweet and cute and adorable and they have no, they're pure exiles. So they have no national allegiance. They have no planetary allegiance. And so they make really great attaches. They're kind of really kind of comforting and lots of different alien races like to be around them. So they often like become attaches to like ambassadors and stuff. So a lot of space stations, space stations consider it really lucky if they get one of these. And the main character, Tristol, he is, he's one of these aliens and he has a mad crush on the human uh, security chief slash detective that's on board the, the space station named Dre, uh, but he doesn't really get kind of like human flirtation and courting rituals. So he sort of, so the, the, the book sort of starts with Tristel trying to figure out what cats are and why you would want to keep them as a pet um, <laughs> and, uh, because he's been asked by some human friends to, to cat sit. Uh, and then of course the cat escapes and hijinks ensue on the space station because what happens when the cat gets into zero gravity? Nobody wants to find that out. <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, and then the a Galloy and the Galloy are like super xenophobic, so they never reach out to humans. And then suddenly a Galloy ship approaches his space station, which is crazy in, in many, many ways, because they, they shouldn't be approaching a space station that has an exile aboard it. And they never talk to humans anyway. Um, and they have this incredibly complicated non pronoun language that kind of indicates status and has to do with all of these different genders. And so the humans are kind of panicking and freaking out. They don't want a war. They don't know what's <laughs> going on. Um, and the spaceship basically says, you know, we have a, we have a, a murdered Galloy and we don't know what to do. We don't have security. We don't have murder investigations. We don't. So we came to you violent humans to figure this out for us. Um, and of course, Dre, the, the, the human love interest is the detective. So, um, so he and Tristel have to team up because he needs Tristel's help to explain how the Galloy work. Um, and so the two of them kind of figure out who done it. And that's, that's basically it <laughs> in a not in a very large nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> How did you go about creating the Galloy? I mean, five genders, no term for murder. I know. There's like so many things that kind of click into this. Is there, is there like coils within coils? Um, I just so like I said, I have a I have an anthropology background. Um, I mean, archaeology is my so obviously the biology and skeletal structures and things is what I, I, I mostly studied via anthropology, but you get a lot of like gender studies and um, cultural representations of gender and all that sort of thing as part of an education when in the United States, if you, if you do an archeology span degree. Um, and so it's always been super, super fascinating to me. I have a, I have a minor in classical mythology with a focus on gender. Um, it, it's just something that, that is, interested me and it's really hard to tease out in the archaeological record um, it's pro to misinterpretation by archaeologists and historians and anthropologists um, so there's a sort of storied history with our own relationship from a scientific perspective with understanding gender and so I just took a lot of that both kind of my education and you know 
how the world now is changing. I spend uh, far too much time on Tumblr. <laughs> so um, I have a lot of like non-binary and gender fluid and gender queer fans. And so I've just been kind of reaching out to friends and acquaintances. One of my um, best friends in the world is a, is a, a bioethicist and a, um, a medical ethicist. And so she deals with like training doctors in how, how to talk to people uh, appropriately about gender. And, and so I, I've, I've had all this sort of stuff messing about and I was like, well, an, a way for me to explore this and have this kind of conversation with myself and the world is through an alien lens. Um, and so I just, I love thought exper experiments. And I was like, so what if we have a race with five different genders and how would their language evolve? How would their culture evolve? How would they treat each other? Like all of these, you know, archeological things to think or anthropological things to think about. Um, and then how would humans, even future humans react when encountering that? And so that's kind of where the, where the conception started. Um, and then I just made them purple cause I like purple. <laughs> Why not? I, I'm a big purple <laughs> fan too. So was there a lot of research kind of building yeah. this? Yeah, I actually have multiple blog posts that are going to – either I'm releasing them right now or I've, I've just released them recently, uh, speaking from the past into the future. <laughs> uh, but I have a bunch of blog posts about, like, a bunch of the research that I did and, like, some book recommendations and stuff like that, both from a fictional perspective and a and a, a non-fictional perspective and, and different blogs and stuff like that. Um, but I like that. You know, I, I, I like researching a lot uh, – I try not to rabbit hole too much because the point is to write the actual book. Right. Um, so mostly what I did is I did that intensive week where I sort of uh, just vomited forth this whole book. Um, and then I went back and like teased it apart and looked into different, almost as I'd almost treated it a little bit as if it were a nonfiction piece um, to go mm. back and see well, what sources do I need to look up? What like um, you know, different pronoun terminate, terms might be you be being used in in hundreds of years you know by humans um that sort of thing and it's and it's <sighs> since both the humans involved i try to be complex in my races whether they're werewolves or aliens um in that like and to not has that not either dystopian or utopianize either race, either humans or aliens. So both races still have issues. Both are still, still dealing with cultural, how the cultures have evolved and, and all of that sort of thing. So I'm not setting the Galloway up as like the perfect model of a possible future. Um, they have a different evolution, a different model. Um, and they're merely a, a vehicle for which, you know, we can examine perhaps some of our own biases and prejudices now. And that's that's getting very very serious because mostly what I want my books to do is make you happy and uh, cheerful and be excited and delighted. Um, and if it makes you think a little, that's great. Um, but really, I just I just want to make everybody happy, and hopefully Tristol will do that because he is he's delightful. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of I guess beta reading did you do to see how your your various fans? handle the the gender discussion hmm. well i have i have um trans and gender queer and gender bending characters already both in my main universe and in my traditionally published books and in all of my um like like my independent and my self-published works and in my novellas and stuff like not some of the main characters some of them side characters and so I know that they're they're open to it, and I also know that the one that you know, for lack of a better term, I have like a queer centered, progressive kind of comfort food brand or business model or whatever, however <laughs> you want to term it. Um, and so I feel like um, most of my super fans are going to be excited because what they want from me is that comfort, is that sort of upbeat, fun, slightly fluffy, slightly thoughtful, but ultimately you know everything's going to be all right um and, and i'm not i'm never going to depress you there's never going to be like scenes of torture it's never going to be angsty you know all of those things it's always going to be um um 
delicious, I guess. Um, I like that as a term for a book. That's just <laughs> really fun. Yeah. It's just going to be tasty yumminess. Um, so they know that. Uh, and that's the, that's the part that they trust. And generally, I feel like they're pretty open-minded about how I'm going to go there and explore that. I don't think I would have done this book, you know, five or six years ago because I, I wasn't sure. I had to kind of test the waters with the San Andreas books and, and some of the other stuff. Um, but I think they're pretty open to it. I don't know. You, you never know. We'll see how everybody <laughs> reacts. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, and I have beta readers and some of them have read it. I was more careful with this book and making sure that, like, I had – uh, sensitivity, what I call delicacy readers. Um, so people within kind of the gender nonconforming community, again, for lack of a better term, um, that was more important to me, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't want to offend, although, you know, everybody's opinion is their own and everyone is entitled to it. So I'm sure if you if you come to any book with the idea of being offended, you're probably going to be, um, unfortunately. So, but I did put a essentially a naked purple dude on the cover as a kind of like, be aware, <laughs> there's gonna be sex at this book. We're gonna we're gonna go there. We're gonna go far out there. Um, so. It's cozy with sex and it's funny <laughs> and it's sci-fi. It's sci-fi exactly. It's got a little bit of everything in it. <laughs> exactly. Do you think you'll revisit this later as like a as a continuing series or? I Love to. Actually, I have another murder mystery in line. I don't consider myself like a mystery writer at all, but um, I, I have, I like immediately. I have this. So I have this thing as a writer where um, I don't write a book until I've had what I call the epiphany, which is I need to actually see a scene with characters in dialogue, and it might not necessarily be the first scene or whatever. But until I see that, I have that crystal moment. I don't feel like I can write the book. So I have a lot of books that I'd like to write, but I've never had the epiphany with. So they're just sort of sitting there. Um, and I've had an epiphany for a second book in this series with Dre investigating another murder and interest all still there and everything. Uh, but I don't, I don't know how people will receive this one. So I don't know if I will, I will write that one, but it's definitely there percolating already. It's a <laughs> so possibility. it's a possibility. Yeah. Um, and the universe, as a as a huge on the whole, because it is a science fiction universe, actually does have another of all things young adult series that's set in it. That's kind of been on the back burner for a really long time, um, which kind of has nothing really to do except with this series, except that the same conceits in terms of faster than light mm -hmm. travel and um, human like uh, and colonization and planetary evolution are the same. Um, and there's like a couple of crossover alien races, but. Um, that's about it, <laughs> but it is the same sort of basic far future. Yeah. If you've got the universe, you might as well keep using it. So you don't Precisely. have to just keep reinventing the wheel. <laughs> Precisely. Yes. Yeah. That's my feeling. <laughs> what do you hope readers take away from this wrong? Well, like usual, I, w I just want them to be like, my favorite thing is somebody writes to me and says, you either humiliated me because I was laughing loudly on public transport. And I'm like, yes, um, you kept me up all night. Like, yes. Or, um, or you just left me with a big smile. So that that's really what I genuinely want is a big smile on people's faces. Um, but it would be nice if, if at people who read it thought a little bit about a bit more about gender and, um, how we intimately link biological sex with gender and that perhaps that's not necessarily uh, that that it, that's not necessarily the I don't know uh, ethical thing to do that perhaps um, gender is in fact a social construct it's just something that that or a cultural construct it's, it's something that anthropologists just accept like if you're an anthropologist you just accept that as a fact like we know we have seen all of these different ancient and modern races or cultures with varying different interpretations of genders. And it just, I don't think it would ever occur to an anthropologist to like, not be like, yes, gender is cultural, <laughs> but it seems that, um, in the world today that that isn't an accepted principle. Um, and so I guess if, if anything, I want people to kind of get it to maybe think a little bit about pronoun use and all that sort of stuff, I guess. Mm -hmm. Now, as both Gail and GL, 
you run across a lot of genres. You've got your urban fantasy. You've got some paranormal. You, now you've got cozy mysteries in space. <laughs> <laughs> Comedy definitely cuts across all of them. Is there like a, a genre that's like you like uh, urban fantasy most or paranormal or just how they all cross up? Or I would say I have wheelhouses more than anything else. So there's okay. a podcast called Reading Glasses that talks about as readers, we tend to have wheelhouses. And if you read heavily in romance, you define those often as tropes. Mm -hmm. You know, like I like the enemies to lover or whatever. Um, but a wheelhouse kind of has other things. So and I would say that there are definitely wheelhouses I gravitate to. So I always write the the um, the heroine's journey. I never write the hero's journey. Uh, regardless, again, this is the gender thing, right? Regardless of the biological sex <laughs> or stated gender of my main character, they're always heroine's journeys because a heroine's journey, it doesn't matter who's undertaking it. Um, so I would say that is one of my things. I um, I always do found family. And I realized recently, I had this big revelation that one of the reasons that I strongly gravitate to reading gay romance in particular is because found family is mm -hmm. a really popular trope within gay romance for obvious reasons. Because if you come to the queer community, it's usually partly found family that brings you there. Because... Um, real family rejected you at least often did when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. And I, I just love that as a, um, as a trope for lack of a better word. Um, and so I, I, I have found family in my books all the time. I, I tend to have ex extremely strong female main characters, uh, except when I'm writing gay romance, <laughs> of course. Um, uh, yeah. And, and lots of queer, I, I was thinking recently that a look and I really embrace would be queer comfort because I feel like that's kind of in all of my books, even the books that, fit, that have um, heterosexual main couples. It's really hard. I grab, I, I, at this juncture, I guess you could say that I trust my readers enough to relax and just write what moves me. I wouldn't have written this book if I didn't think at least some of them would enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what a privilege and, and kind of a blessing and a joy to get to do that. Um, but it has been 10 years, so <laughs> did take a while. <laughs> and you, you mentioned that you, you're you not known for mystery, certainly. So you, you've you taken this turn now to at least explore it once. Are there yeah. other th things out there like attack, you know, going after and trying to write a mystery that are still things you want to do, things you're looking at towards the future? Absolutely. Uh, there's always like I... Uh, adore high fantasy obviously I'm really into world building um, and so like I have a young adult high fantasy it's actually techno fantasy kind of like the Pern books um, mm. or um, <clears throat> Dark Over and um, so you know I'd like to do that I, there's a bunch of stuff that, that I kind of am excited and interested and I'm a pretty voracious and pretty wide reader so that, that I think that makes you generally speaking a relatively wide writer i think it's unlikely i would ever break the trust the like the trust contract that i have with my reader base and write anything like dark i certainly would never write anything gritty or gruesome i, I don't like to read that so I, i'd never write it um and i think i'm out of my dark phase now that i have left high school uh, <laughs> so <laughs> i don't don't do the really kind of darker angst uh, angsty stuff I, I was thinking about contemporary recently, actually, um, and I don't think I could write contemporary. I, I, the moment I start to like think about writing something that's just a contemporary romance or like women's lit or or even something, you know, heaven for friend, like proper lit fic, <laughs> um, it immediately just goes fantastical. I can't, I can't, I, I have to inject. Um, and if I I were to describe myself as anything, it is you know science fiction and fantasy rooted. I like I like the world building a lot, and so I think it's unlikely that I'll ever write something that doesn't have at least that as part of the component. Mm -hmm. So, how did you go from studying archaeology and getting these degrees? to now becoming full-time author, writing all these books. What was that path? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so I was, uh, I have, I have, I have a, a two master's degrees and I was working on my PhD 
Uh, and I always thought I would be an academic. I, I genuinely love archaeology. I'm one of those incredibly lucky people who uh, left one career that she adored for another career that she adored. So, you know, a, a you know, tragedy of choice. But, <laughs> but um, so, and I was about two years, I was about to do my defense and I was about two years out, uh, which would have been my thesis years of finishing my PhD. And... Um, I always wrote. I just I just grew up on what essentially amounted to kind of like a hippie commune kind of thing and uh, surrounded by artists. And the only thing I had learned really from that is that artists never make any money. And so being an author was really a bad idea. So I was like, OK, I'll be an academic because woo, you're profitable. <laughs> <laughs> at least it's at least it's quasi reliable. Right. Um so I, but I always wrote, I just, I just had that need. It's kind of like breathing or something. Um, and I figure if I write, I might as well submit. And so I was submitting and, and writing and submitting. Uh, and then I wrote Solace as kind of a challenge to myself. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I have a propensity for rewriting things over and over and over a million times and never actually finishing anything. And so Solace was like, you will take six months. You will write this weird book. Uh, this was during the paranormal romance and urban fantasy bubble of the late 90s early 2000s and um i was like what i really want from my, i want a bunch of things right i want women to write funny stuff in genre commercial genre and that's pretty rare most of the 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 writers i knew who wrote funny stuff were like terry pratchett christopher moore jasper ford like a bunch of dudes and i was like where are my ladies writing funny where are my where's my urban fantasy set in in a historical time period? You know, I wanted all of these things, and nobody was writing it. And finally, I was like, "Well, that means I have to <laughs> uh, take the challenge." Uh, <laughs> take the challenge, and uh, I really did write it as a challenge. And and Solace is a, is a mashup. It tends to be what I write. Obviously, <laughs> I mean, I'm here talking about a you know space cozy mystery romance so i obviously like mashing up things. And so Solace is steampunk, urban fantasy. Um, uh, comedy of manners romance right it's a bunch of these different things and i was like no one will buy this because i had been in and out of the publishing industry and submitting short stories and i was like this it doesn't have a place in the market there's no shelf it sits on like no one's gonna buy this but i wrote it so i might as well send it out um and i had one of those like, slush pile telephone calls from new york where they in, like within a month somebody wanted to buy my my silly little bit of fluff and i was like no you're joking <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, and so and Solus was a Solus was a slow burn. It it hit the market and it was really word of mouth. Uh, the librarians and the independent bookstores were like behind me a hundred and ten percent. They just loved this crazy little book, and I think it was mostly the funny, but you know, super strong uh, heroine and you know, like gruff, overly emotional werewolves and. Uh, and queer characters from the get-go, and it just appealed to, you know, a kind of segment of society. Uh, and then, uh, so I was right uh, about to do my defense when um, Changeless, my second book, hit the, hit the New York Times, and that kind of seed changed everything. Um, it changed marketing, it changed how much money New York was willing to offer me, and uh, my partner at the time was like, eh. I make enough money to support us. Why don't you see if this, why don't you take a break from academia and see if this writing thing works? And I did, and I haven't been back. <laughs> well done. Yeah. It 10 was, years well, on. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it's serendipity. Um, and a lot of it is, is good friends. And then a lot of it was also like, I am super, um, I'm an archeologist. Archeologists are like the organizers of anthropology departments. You know, we're logistics. We, get large groups of people into foreign lands and then make them shovel dirt around, you know, <laughs> we feed them and house them, blah, 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 blah. You know, we're, we're, we're big on spreadsheets and organizing. So I already had that kind of part of my personality that I think not a lot of authors have. Um, and so when I was successful, I was ready to be like, okay, how many, let's figure out how many books I can write in a year. Let's figure out, you know, like, I like trad, but maybe this independent publishing thing is interesting. Let me go research that and experiment with that. You know, let's try this thing. Um, and I've always been like that, uh, even with my traditional publishers. Like they would be like, "We are not. You sell really good in eBooks." And I was like, "That's because I have romance readers." And they were like, "How do you feel about maybe doing this strange bookbub thing?" And I was like, "I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Why don't we do that?" <laughs> you know, it's like I am game. <laughs> so. Um, I think that has also helped 
is I've always been willing to to take a risk, partly because I have a safety net. It's like I I can always go back to being an archaeologist. That's fun too. <laughs> What's your overall process? I mean, it sounded like, if I understood from from our fifth gender discussion, it almost sounded like you did the first draft of that book at the retreat. Yeah. Um, I work really well, it turns out, in a competitive environment. I didn't realize. (laughs) But if uh, I really am one of those writers who I'm social in terms of I like to sit across from somebody like at a cafe and just type. And just the act of having another writer or a bunch of writers around me also typing is really helpful to me. and part of it is kind of looking up and be like, how many words have you done? Oh, shoot. And then I'm just typing some more, you know. But, yeah, so I do this one retreat every year, and I know I can do 40,000 words at that retreat, um, which is either one novella or most of most of one of the um, GL books. So I usually sort of get prepared ahead of times, whether that preparation is writing the first 10,000 or just get – I'm an outliner, so I'll get all the outline ready. I'll get all the world building ready. Um, and once I hit the ground there, I could just churn out a bunch of words and that's great. I try to do a couple of other kind of long weekend baby retreats. I'd love to find other week long retreats, but the style that I like is pretty rare. And the style that I like is just a bunch of writers writing and not, and no workshops or, or critiques or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do that. And then most of the rest of the time, I, I am not somebody who can handle multiple projects. I learned that about myself the hard way. <laughs> uh, so I have to be working on one book and then close that book out and then move to another one. And so if it's an independent project, what I'll often do, so if it's something that I'm going to be self-publishing, I'll often write the whole thing on a retreat or over the course of a couple of months and then just put it to bed and then focus on incoming copy edits or a proof pass or writing a completely different project and let it sleep if mm-hmm. I can. I find that that marination really helps. Uh, and then I'll go back and do a reread. And I'm um, a multiple editor. I think a lot of comic writers have to be because I, I do passes for like different kinds of comedies. So I'll do like a wordplay pass and then I'll do sort of a slapstick pass. And then I'll do like rule of three descriptive passes to try and get as much different kinds of humor in back into a book as possible. Um, and so, and then I have a, an alpha reader or two and they read before it goes either either into my New York editor or off to my beta readers and then I actually hire and use a developmental editor for my independent stuff as well Um, partly because that that tends to lean more romantic and when I first started writing it I didn't really think of myself as a romance author so I wanted to make sure that I was getting kind of the beats right for romance so Mm -hmm. I have a an editor who specializes actually in gay romance who reads my um, who reads all of my romances and this gives me feedback. And then and then it goes to beta readers for the Parasol verse in particular, because there are like there are twenty five books in that universe and there's lots of crossover characters. So um, most of my beta readers are actually just super fans who are obsessed with the universe and have written me like either um, critical <laughs> letters about mistakes that I made <laughs> in terms of like getting character names wrong or eye colors or something. And usually I'll be like, you would you be interested in being a beta reader? Right. <laughs> Put those people to work. <laughs> exactly. I was like, if you're going to do this anyway, how would you like to get everything ahead of time? And like lots of extra, I give them lots of extra perks as well. Um, special editions and stuff. Um, yeah. So it's, it's quite a process at this yeah. point, but uh, my beta readers are killer. I've got just a team of four now and they're really fast and great. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have, um, I have a couple of awesome, uh, copy editors that I use, and then a proof. The um, the Parasol verse gets a Victor, a, a woman named Shelley Adina, who's a fantastic steampunk author in her own right, and a Regency, and who's really really good on the Victorian era. So it gets a world proof of like a historical proofing, basically. And then um, yeah, and then I have a formatter. I'm a big fan of uh, finding people who are really good at what they do and hiring them uh, to do it for me. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like I, I, I could change my own oil, I'm sure, but I'd really rather find a good mechanic, you yeah. know, that's, and that's how I feel about um, kind of the, the book world as well. So I have a fantastic cover art designer I love working with. Um, and I just got to put my team in place and then hope that, that no one gets sick. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's the key. Nobody can get sick. Right. Not right Nobody now. Sick. Leave me <laughs> very forlorn when that happens. So you mentioned that you read 
a pretty broad swath of stuff. What are you reading right now that you're loving? So I just did a reread on Amy Lane's uh, Fool and His Nanny, which uh, because it got uh, nominated for the Rita Award, mm -hmm. and it was one of the few that did <laughs> that that was that was queer. So I I had read it before, so I just did a reread on that, and I still love it. It's very cute, and I love Amy. Amy's one of the nicest human beings in the world. So um, that was that was really fun to redo, and I will. I'm a huge fan of Mary Calme. Um, I don't know how to say her last name. You but... actually got it right. Did I? Oh, you good. did. Yes, I will read. Pretty much, she's an auto buy for me. I just find th I know she's th th there are tropes in place that that, but I just find her stuff really. It's she's a comfort read for me, and um, as somebody who writes what I hope is comforting for others, like I'm always hunting for authors that give me that same sensation. One of my like constant of all things comfort reread rotation is Alexis Hall's For Real. Um, which is a fantastic BDSM, but it's just like, I don't know what, the, the writing is so good. Um, and I will reread um, R. Cooper, uh, Until the Cows Come Home, the Beings in Love series, which I really, really adore. So, which is a urban fantasy, basically. So you're a podcaster also, about, on, on top of all this other stuff. I know. And... That is like my Completely not connected to anything side project. <laughs> well, I'm look, looking, you know, I'm reading the website, getting to know kind of what I want to ask about. I'm like, a podcast. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and it's about travel hacks called the 20 minute yeah. delay. How did this come about? <laughs> so one of the things that happened to me in the course of this career is I went from being an archaeologist. I traveled a lot as an archaeologist to being an art author where it turns out I travel like five times as much. Um, when I was book touring regularly, I was doing two book tours a, a year at least. And that was not counting all of the conventions and stuff I was doing. And a book tour is like 10 cities in 10 days. I mean, it's it's crazy traveling. So I, I turned into a frequent traveler and I, I'm organ an organizer and I like to hack things and figure out the most efficient way to do everything possible. And I realized I was doing that with travel. And there are two things that I can talk about well, there were three things that I could talk about, uh, books that I love, like literally until the cows and from food that I love to eat and uh, and travel hacks. And I was like, and then I met my friend Piper and Piper um, has a day job that has her traveling 80% of the time. And she has, if possible, more travel hacks than I do. And the two of us are like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so um, I was basically like, Piper, let's do a podcast. And it'll just be like 20 to 30 minutes. And we will just get on and we will chat about a place that it, we've been recently and some like delicate matter of etiquette when traveling, like whether you rec recline your seat or not and how you deal with that. Or recently we did uh, a really good one actually on rental cars. Um, I don't rent a car that often, but Piper does all the time. And she had some awesome tips for like how to get the best rental car and, you know, what apps to use and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then we, we do a little gadget where we're just like, we test a gadget, like a new neck pillow or something. And then, and then we talk about, you know, what is our little gadget thing? Um, and sometimes it's just like, I like the snacky bags. <laughs> like you should always have at least two plastic snacky bags with you because they just always come in useful. Um, so sometimes it's a gadget like that. But we have a really, really good time, and uh, I'm I'm a voracious podcast listener. Like like when we started, I, I'm a fan of this show. So um, I figure, it, it generally speaking, you eventually become a podcaster if you're a big fan of listening to them. That's probably <laughs> true. That's probably true. And I, I think for any of our listeners who are you know thinking about you know their 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 trips to GRL come October. <laughs> Yes. Start listening to the 20 minute delay now to get all your travel yes. situation <laughs> put together. Because Piper and I are both authors. Like we don't, we try to couch our tips as much as possible in terms of um, anybody can use it, but we are both women. We are women who travel alone and we are both authors. So we, we will tackle things like how to travel with a bunch of books, like how to fly with 50 books or what have you. Um, and we, we also talk about like safety when you're staying in a hotel by yourself and that sort of thing. Yeah. So what's coming up for you next this year for, with the writing? So we've, we've got the fifth gender out. What's, what's coming yes. next? Next, I have the final book in my Custard Protocol series coming out, which is uh, Reticence. And that's book four of the Custard Protocol. That comes out in, at the beginning of August. Um, and that's actually rounding out the series is in the Parasol verse for a little while, my steampunk universe. Um, I'm not ruling out doing another series in that universe, but I think I'm going to take a little break 
Um, and I'm on proposal for a new young adult series. So who knows? It's traditional. So <laughs> could take forever. Could suddenly happen. <laughs> you never know. Um, and then in October, I have a, a special collector's edition coming out from Subterranean Press called Fan Service, which is which is for my super fans, which has my two Supernatural Society novellas bundled together with a exclusive short story um, that there's that's a hardcover fan, super fancy edition that that uh, there's only going to be 526 of those printed, and. So that's that's my October release. It's it's so pretty. They give me very pretty covers of terrain. Cool. <laughs> and what's the best way for folks to keep up with you online so they can keep track of all this? Well, in addition to everything else, so in case anybody's in any doubt, I kind of have no life. <laughs> I just, if this is like what I, like I listen to podcasts, I read and I play online uh, and occasionally I write, you know, cause that's my job. <laughs> but so I am on all the things online. Um, I genuinely like social media. I know, I know it's crazy. Um, but you can, so you can pretty much find me on any platform that you like. Uh, if you Google Gail Carragher and then the name of the platform, I will probably pop up. And I try to use the platform in the way that, it's best suited so you know there are pretty pictures on instagram and there are uh, lots of pinned gorgeous dresses on pinterest <laughs> and historical dresses and crazy aliens and then i also have a newsletter um the newsletter is definitely for for super fans so um it's very chatty and it's full of like sneak peeks as to what i'm i'm actually writing and, and not talking about online yet and uh, and i do like freebies and giveaways and stuff there we're going to link to all that good stuff <laughs> in the show notes of course so people can find it easily gail thanks so much for hanging out it's been so much fun oh it's been a real pleasure i i can't say how delighted i i am to be on and i i can't wait to listen to this for the other side Thank you to Dream Spinner Press for sponsoring this week's transcript. If you'd like to read the author interview for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And thanks to Gail for hanging out with me for a few minutes. It was so great to talk to her. And I, I've only read her San Andreas Shifter books so far. And I really want to pick this one up because the idea of the cozy mystery in a space station, <laughs> it's a little mind-blowing to me. <laughs> and even more so after hearing her talk about the, the creation of the book. Exactly. Okay, guys, I think that's going to do it for this week's show. Just a quick reminder before we do, did you know that you can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon? If you're long-term listeners and you've been paying attention, you probably do know that. But in case you're new, uh, the additional support of our superfans helps pay for the cost of producing and distributing this show. Joining is easy, and you'll get special access to monthly bonus episodes and the opportunity to ask questions of upcoming guests. For details, all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Now, throughout this month, our Patreon supporters have the opportunity to leave us their snail mail address so that we will send them a special Pride Month greeting card next month. If you would like one of those, simply go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast, leave us a message there with your address, and we will send you a card next month. Now, coming up next week in episode 190, Jay from Joyfully Jay is going to join us. In addition to her awesome book recommendations, she'll also give us the scoop on the recent Book Lovers Con. I am looking so forward to hearing about this. Uh, so many pictures on Facebook over the past week of people at BLC. I'm looking forward to her take on it. Definitely. So guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone. Please keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and links to everything discussed in this episode, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday at all major podcast distributors. You can also find us on YouTube. I'm Derek McLean. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.